I declare the meeting open to the public. Okay. Um, I can remind members that uh, the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast through Parliament buildings and online this afternoon. And we only have four members attending at the minute. We have three in person in the room, myself, Mike Nesbitt, the Vice Chair, Paula Bradshaw, and we have got Mark Durkin uh, via Starleaf. Um, we believe that Christopher Stelford and Michelle McLean are joining us and John O'Dowd is due to join us over Starleaf in his capacity as, as Carol McLean's deputy. So as and when they come in, they can join the meeting. So agenda item one, we don't have any uh, formal apologies. And then number two, we've got a briefing this afternoon by Dominic Grave QC on the implications of Brexit. Uh, for human rights and Dominic had joined us earlier in the year in June and he agreed to come back a second time to speak specifically about the impact of Brexit uh, on rights. So Dominic, you're very welcome to the meetings. Thank you very much for joining us again. Pleasure. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. Um, so just when you're ready, you can begin your briefing. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and as I understood it, following the last time we met, what we were mainly concentrating on was derogation from human rights was the topic that you wanted to raise with me, which I sought to answer. This time, my understanding was that you were interested in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU and the implications that flowed from our leaving the European Union. Now, I should say, there are a lot of uncertainties here, as I will try to sketch out very briefly, uh, particularly in the context of Northern Ireland, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Just to say something briefly, and I hope I'm not repeating something that you've already heard from your other specialists who come to address you, but when the UK government announced it was leaving the EU, this was under Theresa May, it made clear that it was going to retain EU law, or most of EU law, in our own domestic law, to prevent there being a sort of void into which um, we ended up with a sort of anarchy because nobody knew what the law was anymore, because the EU has contributed enormously to our own national law. Uh, I think it's, it's sometimes impossible just to comprehend the extent to which it has pervaded national law in the United Kingdom, whether it's England, Scotland, or Northern Ireland. Uh, but at the same time, the UK government made quite clear back in 2017 that it wanted to throw off those aspects of EU law which it didn't much care for. And one of the things it had not liked over quite a long period was the impact of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU on our own national law. Um, this goes back quite a long way. Uh, when the Charter was first put forward, the United Kingdom insisted uh, that the Charter was merely or should merely be a declaratory document, setting out fundamental principles of EU law, many of which are in fact a reflection of what's already in the European Convention on Human Rights. But what the UK government didn't want was for the Charter to be used as a, I would call it a standalone mechanism, by which people could claim rights and get them uh, established in our own courts. Bear in mind that unlike at UK level, <coughs> unlike the ECHR and the Human Rights Act, which at most can lead to a declaration of incompatibility with UK Westminster made law, different of course for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, um, the European Union law can in certain cases trump uh, UK statute and the UK government was concerned that this would happen or could happen and thereby areas of national sovereignty as they saw it would be lost. And to a certain extent the United Kingdom's concern about this was not completely misplaced because there have been instances since where individuals bringing claims have brought them both under the Human Rights Act but they've also brought them under the Charter of Fundamental Rights and found that unlike the uh, Human Rights Act, which could at most have led to a declaration of incompatibility, um, actually they've been successful in getting a law overturned. And the classic case, which I set out in my paper 
to you is a case called Benk Harbush, which was a case concerning a, a lady who was employed in an embassy. It was about employment rights. Uh, she had been improperly treated. The question was whether the, um, in view of the fact that the UK gives special status to embassies and other um, uh, diplomatic missions, whether in fact EU law trumped the national statute which did that. And the court found firstly that there was a breach of human rights because she hadn't been able to recover the rights to which she was entitled. Secondly, it said we could make a declaration of incompatibility, but as it happens, Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights allows us to actually set aside the, state, the clauses of the State Immunity Act uh, which breach Article 47. So there is an example, just illustratively, of how the Charter has at times been used. So when the government came to enact the Withdrawal Act of 2018, it produced an extraordinary series of categorizations of rights. I've set them out in paragraph two of my notes, and I don't think I'm going to sort of go through them again, because I point out in three that if you find it muddling, you're in very good company, because it is extraordinarily difficult to follow. But they tried to separate out EU legislation and preserve it so that it could still be used in courts of law even after we've left and finally come out of transition in January. But at the same time, it was quite determined that the Charter of Fundamental Rights was excluded. It allowed general principles of EU law to survive and to a very limited extent the Charter in that if you were trying to interpret what retained EU law means, you could make reference to the Charter and to general principles of EU law. But what you cannot now do, or will not be able to do after January, is to use the Charter, as I say, as a standalone right, which says there's a breach of the Charter, and it can overcome not only ministerial action, but it can overcome primary legislation as well. Now, the muddling aspect of all this, I mean, firstly, perhaps I should just say something else. Uh, it is a very strange situation that they've created because EU law, if, if the EU is anything, it's a legal system. Um, unlike the UK, where Parliament is ultimately um, sovereign, in the EU, the law is sovereign. That's why the Court of Justice is in such a massively grand building in Luxembourg. Um, and it is a legal order. And the anxiety has always been that if the EU isn't ruled by its own very tight set of rules, actually EU law could operate abusively. So in a very curious way, the government's done something very odd in getting rid of the Charter but retaining EU law, because the Charter is in fact a way in which EU law can be checked. Now the government's rationale was always that that getting rid of the charter didn't matter. Uh, and in December 2017, it, it carried out and published a right by right analysis of charter rights. And it claimed that the substantive rights protected by the charter would not be weakened after exit from the EU because the charter, it said, didn't contain any new rights. It was simply a reflection of what EU law had always been. And it said, in any case, those underlying principles were going to be retained by the government in any event. Now, there's a very good document by um, both the Equality and Human Rights Commission, but also the Joint Commission on Human Rights, which was published at about that time in Parliament. You might like to look at it. Um, which disagreed with the government and said, for the reasons I've just given, that actually, although in many cases principles would be maintained, the way the remedies available to people might well be different, and there might well be some, and there were some areas of rights which would disappear completely. I mean, some of them have to disappear. Some of the Charter, for example, concerns the rights of EU citizens to vote in EU elections. Clearly, if we're no longer in the EU, you can't preserve those rights. They disappear, and there's a whole section of them which will cover that. And it's also right to say that some of the rights are covered by similar or almost identical rights in the European Convention on Human Rights, but they are not identical. Now, Northern Ireland is different, uh, but it's not altogether clear at the moment 
how different it's going to be. Because last year, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, after negotiating with Leo Varadkar, um, came to and the EU, came to an agreement where he created the Northern Ireland Protocol. And the Northern Ireland Protocol plainly provides uh, that there are elements of EU law which are going to survive in Northern Ireland and are of direct effect and application and ultimately subordinate to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg after we've gone. Those include the equality of opportunity provisions in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which are set out in Annex 1 of the Protocol, uh, and which are then reflected in a series of EU directives. Well, those EU directives are clearly going to have to continue to be applied. And unless I have wholly misunderstood the position of what the government is trying to do, it seems to me that if they are going to be applied, any individual would be entitled to invoke the Charter, including potentially bringing a direct action in the UK, in the Northern Ireland courts under the Charter, if it considered that it, their rights had been violated. But I should, I should emphasise that there is nothing I have seen at the moment, unless it appears in the statutory instruments that are now, I gather, being enacted in the Commons this week, I think. They may also have been last week, but I haven't seen them. Which, which spells this out. And, of course, it was all left for negotiation with the EU. And that negotiation is intimately linked to whatever negotiation takes place for a free trade agreement, because depending on the terms of that agreement, it may have a bearing on how the protocol, as we know, is actually going to operate in Northern Ireland. Other areas of the annexes are trade, VAT, electricity and state aid. Now, those are probably more economic than individual rights. But again, there might be rights there which an individual or a company might seek to use the charter in order to get a right which wouldn't exist elsewhere in Great Britain. Um, we now have the Internal Markets Bill. And as you'll be aware, the Internal Markets Bill has some very controversial clauses in it, which I've spoken out, pointing out the potential breaches of international law. Indeed, not just potential. I think introducing clauses 42 to 47 was a breach of international law in itself, and no responsible government should ever have done it. But of course, if those were to go through Parliament, then actually the UK government has an override, I think, of every aspect of the protocol. And how they would use that, and it can all be done again by statutory instruments, um, we are simply not in a position at the moment to say. So in one way, I have to say that I think a consideration of the charter rights in respect of Northern Ireland may be a bit premature because until you know what the long term outcome is going to be of the current negotiations between the UK and the EU, it's difficult to know exactly how they're going to be framed and also difficult to know exactly what the government is going to try to do with the Internal Markets Bill. And I should say at the moment, but quite frankly, I don't think the Internal Markets Bill is going anywhere. I think the House of Lords will throw it out, or at least what they'll do. They've taken out the clauses, and I think that if the government tries to put those clauses back in, the Lords will stick to their guns. And that could mean that the bill falls, which would land the government, I might add, with an immense headache, because unless they decide to immediately have a prorogation and a new session of Parliament, they've either, they can't get the bill in its current form through, and they need it by the 31st of December, because without it, there is no internal market within the United Kingdom. Uh, so they've got quite a big crisis coming down the track. I mean, it may be that they're hoping they'll have a free trade agreement by then, in which case they can just quietly drop the clauses and then the rest of the bill will go through. That's one possibility. The other possibility, I suppose, is that they might reintroduce the bill um, without the offending clauses. Uh, which they uh, potentially could do and rush it through as an emergency. I mean, it is a feature of all this that the legislation is being so rushed. I mean, it is, to my mind, as a lawyer, I, I know governments do things when they're forced to it, but we really are living in a strange world where almost the entirety of this complex area of law is being made by statutory instruments. That was what was done under the Withdrawal Agreement Act, 
the entirety of the Northern Ireland Protocol and its implementation is left to SIs. And similarly, the new powers the government's trying to take in the internal markets bill are similarly entirely dependent on statutory instruments and indeed try to oust the jurisdiction of the courts, which is another reason why the House of Lords has, um, I think, pretty clearly indicated that they won't have it. And they took out Clause 47 as well, which does that. So um, I've taken a few minutes, um, I think, to summarise my paper. Um, and, and I hope that that may help contribute to your discussion. I had the benefit of hearing that Professor McCrudden had come along, I think, to you last week. So I did go online to watch what he had to say. Um, so I'm familiar with some of the things he's been talking about. And obviously, I'm familiar with the broad outline of what the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission was thinking of in terms of a Bill of Rights. And we discussed that when I was here in June. Uh, and I'm very happy to help you in, in any way I can. Um, I was asked to go on Radio Alsa this morning, but I was sort of being pushed as to what, what line you should take. I want to emphasize, uh, I'm here to help. I, don't, I, have, I have some of my personal views, but ultimately what line you decide to take is a matter for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic, and uh, my apologies if in my introduction I oversimplified your, your sort of brief for today. I, I know it was uh, you were right in that you were asked specifically to talk about the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And as you have pointed out both in your briefing and verbally there, that this is all very um, complicated. Um, I suppose I, I, would, I would ask you to expand upon the, the points you're making there around your thought that the internal market bill isn't going to go anywhere and you know I know we're having this conversation and obviously we're 50 <coughs> days away from from the deadline and the big thing that we're hearing over and over again is that there is a lack of clarity and we're not quite sure what's going to happen both specific to the charter and to the internal market bill and whether or not it, it will proceed um you you can't see it, it, it going ahead you think that, that the, the clauses that have been removed by, by the lords will either stay removed or the entire, entire bill will, will fall? Uh, it's difficult to know. The, the reasoning behind all this is, is really complicated. And first of all, just to make the point clear, the, the internal markets bill really falls into two parts. Um, the first part is about creating an internal market within the UK, and it mainly concerns Scotland and Wales, although there is a Northern Ireland element to it. Uh, and you can make criticisms, and indeed I've heard nationalist criticism in Scotland of the way it's been handled, but I think there's probably at least a degree of consensus that maintaining an internal market within the United Kingdom is quite important. I mean, if you don't have an internal market within the United Kingdom, then you are going to have complete economic and trade mayhem with catastrophic consequences. It's, it's vital that there should be free flow of goods and services between different parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and, and so the, the argument, I think, over the first part is, could the UK government have done it in a different way? Could it have been more consensual? Could it have been done giving an effective veto on the repatriated powers from Brussels, hoping that in reality, no government in a devolved area would be mad enough to decide to break the single market up but at the end of the day, somebody has to carry the ultimate responsibility. And so I have, whilst I think one can criticise the government's approach, um, I have some sympathy with the government that the internal market needs to be protected. The second part is the bit they introduced, which is this extraordinary series of override clauses. Now, just to explain, um, the UK has always seen itself, having been Attorney General, as a rule, an observer of the rules-based international system. Uh, we help create it. We're signed up to some 14,000 treaties which are still binding on us. I mean, they vary from you know, maritime access deals to the United Nations Charter to the European Convention on Human Rights. And about 800 of them, I think, have arbitral mechanisms by which you can resolve disputes over interpretation in the sense of the Court of Justice of the European Union. That's all it is. It's an arbitral tribunal ruling on the treaty that we have signed up to. It just happens to be, happened to be, you're out of it now, even though it's still bound, um, it happened to be just a rather important treaty. Um, and I cannot think of any government 
in modern times in the UK. Indeed, I, mean, I, I think I'm, I'm not even sure I can think of any government in, in what I would call sort of you know, post 19th, post 18th century history, really, that has deliberately set out to breach an international treaty obligation. And in this case, it's breaching an international treaty obligation that the Prime Minister signed up to finally 10 months ago or 11 months ago. Uh, and then enacted into private law by primary legislation in January of last year. This year, rather, sorry. Um, and suddenly the government said, oh, we're, not, we're, you know, we're going to take powers because we think the EU are going to misuse the powers of the protocol. We are going to take power, uh, necessary powers that we can override the protocol if we think it's necessary and the justification was to make sure that the supermarket shelves in Northern Ireland stayed full. Now, I have no idea what's been going on in the negotiations. I must say I'm a little bit startled by the idea that the EU would wish to create economic mayhem and raise the political temperature in Northern Ireland by preventing the free flow of goods from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and vice versa. I can see that technically they could do it, but seeing that the whole purpose of the protocol was to uphold the Belfast Agreement, and it would hardly be upholding the spirit of the Belfast Agreement, I find it hard to believe that they ever made that threat in negotiations. I really do. Um, and there's never been any real evidence advanced. And interestingly, the arguments brought forward by the UK government to say that they believe this threat existed were all made after they introduced the legislation. And the legislation seems to me to have been introduced with a sort of blackmail intent to the EU. Look how serious we are. If you continue on this and we end up with no deal, we will regard the protocol as something that we can rip up if, we, uh, if, it, if it's interfering with the single UK single market. Um, what I don't think, I mean, I, I simply can't read the government's behaviour. Um, I, I can't understand the behaviour of my successors as law officers in ever allowing this to go through. You noted that the Treasury Solicitor, who's the senior civil servant lawyer in government, resigned, and ultimately Lord Keane, uh, the Advocate General for Scotland, resigned as well, although he seemed to be prepared to at least try to steer the government in a reasonable direction and was prepared to accommodate them to an extent, but he eventually found he'd run out of road. The reaction in Parliament and in the UK, certainly in England, has been one of horror. And the horror isn't confined to Remainers or ex-Remainers. It also includes people who uh, are supporters of Brexit, like Lord Ham, like Michael Howard, Lord Howard of, of, of Libney. Um, there's an, a retired Lord Justice of Appeal, Mr. Sir Richard Aikens, who's a very distinguished lawyer, but has been an advocate of Brexit, um, who said, you know, the idea that you can do this is completely and totally unacceptable. He's written a, a very good article on it in Prospect magazine recently. Um, and that's why the government lost in the House of Lords by, I think, is it 460, is it 430, 435 to 165? Or it may be the other way. It may, it may be 135, 435 and 165. I can't remember the exact figure. It's a massive loss with a huge Conservative rebellion. And I don't see the Conservative peers backing down. I certainly don't see the crossbench peers changing their position on this. They've now taken <laughs> the offending clauses out of the bill. Um, there's also senior retired members of the judiciary and the Lords who criticised it. Um, and the ouster clauses in it that prevent judicial review of the ministerial decision making are also seen as being of an exceptional nature. So having taken all that out, I would be very surprised. I mean, the bill goes back to the House of Commons, I think in early December, if I've understood correctly. Um, and once that happens, uh, they could, I'm sure, use their parliamentary majority in the House of Commons to put it back in, although there will presumably be another rebellion by some Conservative members, and bear in mind that some have stayed. <coughs> Whether enough to get rid of the government's majority in the Commons, I don't know, but it would be... I would have thought harder for the government to put the clauses back in in the Commons uh, than, it is, than it was for them when they tried to resist them being taken out 
in the Commons and were successful in resisting it. I think there'll be a lot of MPs who will go quietly to the whips and say, look, this is crazy, what are we doing? Um, but even if they succeed in doing it, I think the Lords will hold out. And the rules of the House of Commons are that if the ping-pong, as it's called, batting the bill back between Lords and Commons, happens three times, uh, and insistence on the disagreement, then that's it. The bill in its entirety, not just the offending clauses, but the entire bill collapses and it goes. And to bring it back in and force it through under the Parliament Act, the government would have to prorogue Parliament, have a new Queen's speech and start a new session and then push it through the House of Lords uh, against the House of Lords' uh, will. Um, so is that possible? Well, yes. Uh, but as I say, it's a very strange situation. And the irony is that if it was designed to show the government's strength, it doesn't seem to me to have worked. On the contrary, the government has attracted a lot of criticism for doing this. And it's hard to see why they've done it. But if indeed the EU is going to behave in the perfidious way that um, has been identified, then should we leave with no deal and the EU starts playing dangerous games with the the spirit of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in February, March of next year, the same legislation could be brought back in. It would raise the same problems of international law. But then some of us pointed this out to the government this time last year. That the Northern Ireland Protocol was fraught with risk for the unity, economic unity of the United Kingdom. You just weren't listened to. So, it can't have taken the government by surprise, although sometimes with this Prime Minister, I don't really understand what it is that he bothers to read. Thanks, Dominic. I'm, I'm sort of getting a sense of your um, bemusement and frustration uh, in equal measures there, and I suppose we all feel the same uh, at this stage. I just want to get an understanding from you. So... I took the, the last time that you were here, you had spoken about the fact that the, the charter rights are in some ways add ons to the, con, the convention rights. The UK government have stated clearly that they don't think the loss of the charter is a loss of, of rights, and you've pointed out in your presentation that you think that the, their view is, is an error. If we were to take the position in the North, and last week Chris McCrudden had said that there was a potential that if we tried to implement some of the charter rights through a Bill of Rights that we would come up against the fact that they're reserved matters but that there's a possibility for us to do it within the transition period. But if we try to, to implement some of those rights through a Bill of Rights for the North but the Internal Market Bill does proceed and it allows for the repeal of legislation made in the North by Westminster and the British government are of the, of the, of the uh, belief that the loss of the, of the charter isn't a loss of any rights. It, does it sort of leave us in, in a catch-22 that it may be our belief that, that some of these rights still apply in the North, but when it comes to the sort of realisation of them, they, they don't? Oh, yeah, well, yes, I, mean, I, I, think, I think Chris McCrudden had rightly identified that this was extremely complicated. Yeah. Forget for one moment about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, if you look at the Charter in its totality, bear in mind that the Charter is a rather odd document. Even under EU law, some of the rights in the Charter have usually been held only to be declaratory. So, just to take one example, um, the right to health, uh, Article 35. I mean, lawyers may argue around this, but I think the current state of EU law does suggest to me that that is not an enforceable right. It's an aspirational statement. Um, it, 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 couldn't enable one, somebody, I think, to bring a standalone claim within the United Kingdom that they had been deprived of their right to health, although there may be all sorts of other areas, other places where they could go to try and do that. And, and of course, discrimination law might kick in. But, but it doesn't appear at the moment to be a standalone right. So taking, as I've said in my paper, just taking the charter and saying, let's turn the charter into the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, 
you've got to bear a couple of things in mind. One, that some of the charter rights are probably not really rights at all. They are aspirational statements. Others are undoubtedly going to be, fall into reserved areas so that if you attempted to enact a Bill of Rights on them, you might well be subject to legal challenge and end up in the Supreme Court as to whether you had the power to do it. On the other hand, there are lots of rights in the Charter, and I tried to set up, I, I, should, I should say, this is not a completely definitive list. Um, you know, I, I haven't had a chance of debating this with fellow lawyers. They might say, oh, there's something you've left out. But just trying to go through it and apply my own mind to it, I tried to do a list of, of rights which probably, I think, fall within devolved areas. Now, there is nothing in principle to prevent you as an assembly legislating in your own devolved areas as long as it doesn't intrude into reserve matters. You can do that. I mean, in a sense, the NIHRC famous paper, which we discussed in June, was in some ways an attempt to take lots of charter rights and turn them into legally enforceable rights. And of course, it attracted a lot of controversy because some people said that it wasn't at all what had been envisaged in the Belfast Agreement. It was creating an overarching right structure for Northern Ireland uh, of a kind that was not intended in the, Bel in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Uh, that, that's a debate. Um, and I think I indicated in June that I, I could understand the force of that argument. But it wasn't quite how I'd seen it at the time that the, the Belfast Agreement had been put, put together. But that having been said, Ultimately, if you are as an assembly and as a government prepared to take the cost of creating an overarching rights structure, a cost both of surrendering potentially powers to the judiciary and secondly, uh, potentially economic costs which may have to be paid for, it's your right to do it. Now, where does the markets bill come into that? Well. In a way, I don't think the markets bill comes into this one way or the other. And what is the case is that there are undoubtedly some rights in the Charter, and I, this, I think it's what Professor McCrutton was saying last week, and I agree with it. You can't have the Northern Ireland Protocol without EU law continuing to apply to Northern Ireland in those areas where the Protocol bites. Therefore, Northern Ireland, it was intended post January the 1st next year, is going to be subject to a very different relationship with EU law than the rest of Great Britain. Although, I should stress that at the moment, the detail of that, I don't have, and I don't think Professor Chris McCrudden had either, or he would have told you about it. And unless something's happened within the statutory instruments, which makes it clearer, I haven't seen it yet. And I think it was also to be the subject of negotiation. Now it's clear that the Internal Markets Bill has a real bearing on that. Because it's quite possible that if the Internal Markets Bill goes through in its current form, the government might simply get rid of those rights um, if it chose to do so. Or even if it didn't get rid of the rights, it might, for example, that the rights insist that the rights be interpreted in the courts of Northern Ireland in accordance with what I would call English GB practice, that's without the Charter being capable of being invoked to give you a direct right of action, as opposed to being used as an interpretive aid. But I don't know the answer to that question because I can't read the mind of the government. Yeah, and I suppose what you're saying there, I mean, the reality is that after the December uh, deadline, we, we still have a, a sizable proportion of the population in the north who will still be EU citizens. So it's, it's difficult. Just my, my last um, question, just when you talk there about um, discrimination and the socioeconomic element of things, and obviously Chris McCrudden had given us a presentation last week where he had spoken about the different sort of models of enforceability and potentials um, for, for how these things would be enforced. So we have a situation now at the minute where you could say that there was just there's discrimination against two specific sections of society and that um, ab abortion was decriminalised at the end of, of last year here in the north, but we don't have early medical abortion services 
implemented through the trusts the way we would like. And we also have a situation with uh, a transgender service where the, the health minister has has provided the rationale that the, the, there's not the resource to um, to facilitate healthcare for for transgender individuals in the north, and we have a, a waiting list hi higher than four years now. If if it was the case that that healthcare was a right that was that had to be enforced, people that are suffering, and in both of those instances, it's one section of the community that that is affected. That that could, that could be challenged. So, I mean, I suppose my argument would be that if if healthcare was a right that was enforced. We would we would see an end to discrimination against people. Yes, um, but I mean that could happen by one of two ways. I mean, one is that if you were to have a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights which specifically covered healthcare, but it would have to be you know, your drafting would have to be quite careful as to whether how specific it is. That might provide an avenue. Um, it's possible that if the protocol applies as is intended, that rights might be claimed on the non-discrimination directives of the EU that are going to survive afterwards, although I wouldn't, you know, without doing a lot of work on that, I wouldn't want to pronounce on that, because that may not be, those rights may not extend as far as that, but there are rights undoubtedly for men and women uh, within that. Um, it, it, you find yourselves in a rather strange position. If the protocol goes ahead as intended, then I think on many equality areas of the law, the law is going to stay as it is in Northern Ireland after the 1st of January. Uh, that seems to me to be the bottom line, uh, because that's what was promised in the protocol. Um, although, as I say, it's very slightly opaque, because no detail's been fleshed out on it and what the EU is going to require under the protocol. And you might wish to discuss that. I mean, it's a subject which may have already been discussed by, with, with the EU directly. Um, but clearly, I mean, if the Internal Markets Bill provides a mechanism for overriding the protocol, then you may lose those anyway. But that would still allow you to bring in, if you wanted, a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights as long as it only concerns devolved matters and doesn't touch on reserved ones. And that option has always been there. That's why the NIHRC produced its detailed blueprint. But as I say, some people said that went too far. And I can understand that because creating socio-economic rights is a controversial topic. It's something that has not been done in the rest of Great Britain. Uh, and it was specifically considered and rejected when the Labour Party introduced the Human Rights Act in the, in the late 1990s, because it was felt that it was a step too far from, from, parliamentary, from parliamentary sovereignty. No, I, I, I understand. None of this is straightforward, Dominic. Thank you very much. I'll pass now to... <laughs> I hope that's clear. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal, thank you. Mike? Chair, thank you. And Dominic, as, as ever, thank you for your wisdom. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with a confession. I, I missed your appearance on Radio Ulster this morning, but I understand you had to begin by correcting an assertion with regard to the role of the committee, uh, which is not to bring forward a Bill of Rights, but to consider the merits the merit thereof. Of Bill of Rights, yes. Yeah. I did. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's always worth putting that on record, although it may well be our deliberations end up with a recommendation yeah. that, that we do so. You, you began by talking about a number of uncertainties, mm -hmm. and realising your, your answer may involve the word string and length, I'm wondering <laughs> how long do you think it, it may be before we get certainty rather than uncertainty? Oh, I think you're going to get, you must get greater certainty by January, because it, one of two things will have happened by January. Uh, uh, there's no suggestion that transition is about to be extended. Well, I suppose it could happen at the very last minute. Indeed, I don't think we should entirely rule out the possibility that at the very last minute, if there is a deal, there is insufficient time to get it ratified in the parliaments of EU nations. And so we might just end up with an emergency meeting of the European Council, 
um, an agreement to extend transition. There's an extra treaty between the UK and the EU by four, six weeks. And if there is a deal, people would probably accept, <coughs> would probably accept that. Um, but I think we've got to act on the assumption at the moment that we are out of transition on the 1st of January. Now, that does mean that by the 1st of January, there needs to be some clarity ought to be clarity as to what the protocol is going to do and how it's going to operate. Uh, and obviously, if the protocol is operating in the way that I think was envisaged, I say I think because it's a very opaque document. And I, I wasn't, it's also bear in mind, I'm out of Parliament, I wasn't present for the debates in January when it was debated, although my impression of it was that it was given very, very little scrutiny. Um, but if it operates in the way that I think is intended, then there are going to be some Charter of Fundamental Rights rights that are going to continue to be enforceable in Northern Ireland in exactly the same way as they were previously, even though they will not be in mainland Great Britain. I think that's how I read it. Um, but clearly... Um, if the government persists with the internal markets bill and gets the power to interfere with that, you could end up in January with something different. But you know, without wishing to counsel you to delay, uh, from the point of view of considering your Bill of Rights, you're probably going to want to wait until January or February in order to set to, to, so that you can finally be told definitively at the Assembly by your, your staff and others what the current framework of your rights now is. Because without knowing that, it's a bit difficult to start crafting your own Bill of Rights. You, you will probably be aware that, that, that there is a feeling among some in Northern Ireland that we're heading to a position where your rights will depend on whether you consider yourself to be a British citizen or an Irish citizen. From, from what you're saying, that ain't necessarily so. I'm not, yes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely certain about that. Um, I, I, I mean, I remember that we debated this back in 2018 in Parliament. It is true that there will be, living in Northern Ireland, a, a significant number of people who may identify themselves as Irish, uh, because they may have I did it was Irish and British. You could, you could do that if you want to as well. <laughs> but at least, and will therefore see themselves as EU citizens. But leaving aside the protocol for one moment, they will be EU citizens living outside the EU. Um, and I don't think that they will enjoy... I, I, I've not been persuaded that they're about to enjoy separate rights from being uh, from the, the nationals living in Northern Ireland who say, no, I'm not Irish, but I'm British. It seems to me they will all enjoy the same rights that are conferred on them by the protocol. Without the protocol, there are no rights because we've the EU rights that are going to do it to apply because we've left. Uh, except in so far as the UK Parliament wishes to grant them, which is what the current issue is all about. I think everybody will have the same rights. The question is, is that whether rights derived from our EU membership survive in Northern Ireland in certain forms, in which case they will be, I think, applicable to everybody. It's most interesting. Thank you. Well, one, one final thought, Dominic. And, um, the chair talked about the right to health care, which I think I, I can understand that concept. You mentioned the right to health, which strikes me as a much broader concept. And I wonder how broad that can go. For example, it, it impacts on education, surely, in that, that we would have a duty to make sure people are educated to know about exercise and diet. Um, could, could a citizen go to the courts and try to get tobacco white lawed because it's bad for your health? Could they try and get alcohol banned from sale because it's bad for your health? Well, well uh, we mustn't get too carried away, I think. Um, yeah, I think I'm on record of, of expressing some reservations about 
write sort of an extensive nature like this. Um, much as I've been, you could say my career may have been blighted by my support for human rights, I, I've always taken the view that human rights are, you know, should be civil rights and basic and not extended too far and also what we identify as being core human rights, the right to life, the right uh, fair trial, torture, and uh, not to be tortured or ill-treated. And the, um, I've never been, I've always been slightly anxious about rights which are clearly heavily dependent on the socio-economic climate that exists after all. If you're in the middle of an economic crisis, there may be some things in terms of health care you can't afford it. What do you do about it? Now, if you look at the NIHRC proposals, um, they understood that. And so, to an extent, although they wanted these sorts of rights, they said, you know, within the, the, the bounds of the of socio-economically possible. But then the question arises, who decides this, what is socio-economically possible? Is it the Assembly or Parliament in the United Kingdom, well, then that's just as things are now. After all, in Parliament in Westminster, and I'm sure in the Assembly, issues around health care are debated all the time. But ultimately, the buck stops with you. Or are you going to end up with a situation where a judge sitting in the High Court in Belfast says the government is, the Assembly government is under an obligation to do X, Y, and Z, because otherwise it's in breach. And that may cost millions of pounds. And if the millions of pounds aren't available, and how do you strike the balance between that and spending the millions on something else? So these are, those are the issues. But that having been said, there are some countries um, like Canada that have followed a model which goes down this road. And I, as I say, I listened to what Professor McCrudden had said. He, he was, and also he identified some possible halfway houses these are not disreputable things to do, but you just need to think through what it is you want. And one of the merits of devolution is I think you can have what you want if you collectively come to an agreement that that is what you do want. Uh, and it's not for me as an as a English resident of the United Kingdom to say, well, you can't have it or you shouldn't have it. You just need to think through the implications very carefully. Mm. And that phrase, if, if collectively you come to agreement, is, is highly pertinent today. Dominic, thank you very much. Thank All you, right, Chair. Thank you. Paula? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much um, for coming to the committee again today. Um, my question would follow on from Mike's there, and it was in relation to health care, and you had mentioned around um, you could get around this with discrimination laws, and I was thinking more around disability rights. And yeah. what, where we are in, in Northern Ireland, we're quite far behind in some aspects of disability rights and there's been talk for years around a single equality um, yeah. or you know build, build to bring everything up to, to speed do you think that could uh, meet the needs of human rights <coughs> compatibility or requirements or do you think that would fall short and do a disservice for example to disability um the sector i don't see why it should i mean it's worth bearing in mind you know what is a bill of rights um, a Bill of Rights is a piece of legislation passed by the Assembly which sets out uh, legal rights, possibly in general terms rather than highly specific terms, which are subsequently capable of implementation. It, in that sense, it's no different from any other piece of legislation unless it's intended to provide some form of entrenchment. Um, and, and as you know, Westminster level, this can't really be done, actually. It's why the Human Rights Act itself could be overridden if somebody wants to pass a subsequent piece of legislation. The only thing is, is, of course, at assembly level, you are bound by the Human Rights Act. You can't legislate outside of it. Um, but you know, taking the Welsh example, the Welsh Assembly Government decided to go ahead and do legislation on children, which is taken from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which hasn't been done in England, although there are children's acts. So, I mean, before we get too carried away with the differences, but it decided it wanted to do that. It's just a standalone piece of legislation, but it's undoubtedly added to rights, as one would understand it, um, within Wales. So if you want to do something on disability, as long as it's within your devolved competence, you can do it. I don't think that's selling people short. I mean, there may be an argument that rather than getting carried away with overarching bills of rights, um, if there is a consensus within the Assembly that there are certain things that you would like to tackle, which may not be called a Bill of Rights, 
but actually are effectively rights-based issues and do them on an ad hoc basis. Yet the end result is not necessarily going to be significantly different. Indeed, there's no reason why it should be different at all. It's just that you would cover one topic rather than trying to look at a whole series of things at the same time. Yeah, and I suppose that would get away from some of the, the symbolism around it and maybe some of the um, difficulties that some parties or some sections yeah. of society have had around actually having a standalone Bill of Rights um, per se. But um, I think what has come through for me what I, from previous contributors would be around sort of a um, that sort of pre-legislative scrutiny stage, you know, where we would have some sort of framework or matrix that we would have to sort of filter everything through and um, I'm not sure whether you contributed to that in your last, I can't remember, apologies, but, you know, is that something that you think the pre-legislative scrutiny stage would be a, a key component in us making sure that everything going through this place, you know, would have that human rights compliance? Yes, uh, just, just, to, just to be clear about this, um, any piece of legislation introduced at Westminster has to be signed off by the law officers. So I used to do this about its compatibility with convention rights. And I'm pretty sure that you must have the same mechanism here in uh, Belfast as well, because you are absolutely bound by the Human Rights Act. So I would expect that any piece of legislation is crawled over by your lawyers that it's HRA compatible. But what you could do, and I think this was what Professor McCrudden was talking about, was to enact a piece of primary legislation saying that any piece of legislation you pass must not just look at HRA, which of course would override it anyway, because if you pass a piece of legislation in breach of the HRA, it can be struck down eventually in the Supreme Court and just come to an end. Um, but that you were also considering whether it met a number of other benchmarks that you had set for yourselves and that you would require that to be fed into your own legislative process. I think that's what I understood him to mean. I mean, forgive me, I, I haven't read his paper, I, but I, I, I listened to, his, to the online previous um, uh, it, uh, hearing because I was very interested to hear what he had to say. But that's what I understood him to mean. Absolutely no reason why you can't do that if that's what you wanted to do. Um, and it would mean that you are constantly informing yourselves of, of this area and the impact that it might have in certain areas and whether it's meeting, meeting things. And what's got to be... When I was attorney in England and Wales, I did have a slight tendency to say to my colleagues in government, please don't bring in symbolic legislation. Um, there's been a tendency in the last 25 years to legislate for symbolic reasons. The government at times at Westminster set itself targets which were not supposed to be justiciable, so they couldn't be enforced in the courts, but they were declarations of intent about meeting certain targets. And I have to say, as a lawyer, I was never very comfortable with it because I said it either means something or it means nothing and you're just misleading the public. But that's a different thing, I think, from saying we are going to make sure that in our own legislative procedures in Northern Ireland, there are certain things that will always be considered beforehand and that we will show that we have given that consideration before we legislate. It might not indeed need primary legislation at all. It might just be a matter of changing your practices and standing orders within the, the Assembly. I wouldn't know. You'd have to go away and look at that. Yeah, and I suppose it, it was that latter point, and it wasn't necessarily about the draftsmen or the people behind the scenes, the, the clerk and, and the, the officials within yeah. the committees. It would be more us as the legislators Absolutely. actually yeah. being very much involved in that part yeah. of the process yeah. so that it's at the forefront of our thinking and, uh, and our working when we are well, doing the scrutiny at committee. Yeah, pre-legislative processes are really valuable. And, and let's face it, Westminster legislation is, I'm afraid, a pretty poor model. Be absolutely blunt with you. Um, the legislation, I mean, I know that ideally in Westminster style legislation, you should have a white green paper and then you have a white paper. And then you bring in sometimes a draft bill for pre legislative scrutiny. Um, and then you enact the legislation. And of course, you've got the House of Lords, which you, you know, a bicameral system so that there is an extra check. But it is noteworthy in the Westminster system, the number of times it's the poor old House of Lords that picks up the pieces where the detail isn't as good as it should be. 
And the reason for that is because politics means that legislation is often rushed. Now, you are a unicameral assembly, um, and you are... The more pre-legislative scrutiny you do, and the more that you can build consensus, particularly because of the very unusual nature of the political system in Northern Ireland with power sharing, the more it may be capable of giving mutual confidence that you are looking together at similar issues and coming to the right conclusions on them, which then enables you to, uh, to go forward uh, consensually, which is very important. So, yes, I mean, I, I would have myself have thought, particularly in the Northern Ireland context, that that could be extremely valuable. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Paul. Thank you. I can see that Mark has his hand up. Mark, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Dominic, for the presentation. I was going to ask a couple of questions about the Article 2.1 of the, the protocol, but You've already touched on that, Chair, and, and Dominic answered them, and I'm afraid to ask any more because that will just give us more questions, I think, <laughs> than answers. That's no fault of yours, of course, Dominic. Now, I was going to ask something that's not strictly related to the, the, the Brexit stuff, but perhaps uh, indulge me while you're here. The government, I believe, has launched a review of administrative law chaired by Lord Fox, QC, yeah. which will consider the scope of judicial review. Now, judicial review has been a very important mechanism for people here in Northern Ireland to assert their rights, particularly, I suppose, recently in relation to the legacy issues like victims' pensions. In your view, would any con or curtailment of access to JR undermine the rights agenda in the agreement? And might that be something the Bill of Rights might incorporate? Yes, it, it might undermine the rights in the agreement. It might even be a breach of the protocol. <laughs> yeah, it's a rather complicated... I mean, often JRs are, can be based on EU law. So um, it could potentially do this. I, I should explain, I find this review very, very hard to read, what the government intends to do with it. Um, it's coming for quite a lot of flack at Westminster. Um, and I'm not sure what Lord Falk's... It, it, its origins lie in the events of last year. They seem to centre around issues like the royal prerogative and prorogation, the royal prerogative and trigger it in Article 50. Uh, there's a general view that judicial power has been expanding in a way that some people criticise and say undermines Parliament's... The, 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 the accountability should be between ministers and parliament and not this judicialization of our lives. And whilst I have some limited sympathy that we've got to be careful, I mean, if you want to, to, to follow this with interest, look at what Lord Sumption has said about, about the risks from judiciary intruding more and more into the political sphere. Although a lot of it's often happened because Parliament has decreed that it should, but he's made, he's made a number of perfectly reasonable points that there needs to be ju judges cannot replace the democratic process. And that if they try to, then you're going to end up in a, in a very unsatisfactory place. Although he's never called for the repeal of the Human Rights Act, I should add, never. Um, but he, he's made a perfectly good critique. Um, but I think the government is barking up the wrong tree. And I, unless the report is hijacked, in a sense, by a, a, a group of people with rather extreme views, particularly within the policy exchange, and the, who, who, which is the think tank that's done the Judicial Powers Project, I wouldn't get necessarily too worked up at the moment that you're suddenly going to end up with a, a judicial review recommendations for change that are entirely different to those which we have. And in any case, justice is devolved. So unless the Northern Ireland Assembly <laughs> wishes to follow uh, what's going to be done in England and Wales, which is where it would be limited, I don't think it would have an impact on Northern Ireland at all. OK, well, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Dominic. Thanks. Is that you, Mark? John, yeah, I see you're online as well. Do you have any questions? 
Um, uh, thank you, Dominic. That, that presentation was very interesting. Uh, though I think in terms of judicial reviews, uh, the bar is actually lower here to access a judicial review than it is in England and Wales. Uh, so we, ha we have a more favourable system in that, in that sense. Uh, whether it is the bar sat at the right level, that is another debate, but that's for another, another committee meeting. I was actually interested, and again, this is not directly linked to the work of the committee, but I was actually linked or interested to your comment about legislation and when legislation is necessary. Uh, because we do sometimes have an environment where it's a bill for every ill. And as a former minister, I didn't always adhere to that uh, principle, often policies or other ways of solving a problem. So I don't know if you want to add any further comments to your, your, your previous comments about that. Oh, well, I, I, although I may have been kicked out of the Conservative Party, I suppose I remain a Conservative with a small c. Um, I, I think, as I said, I, I, I worry about symbolic legislation that's cluttering up um, the, um, the statute book. Um, good legislation is well-drafted, specific, targeted, clear and understandable. Yeah, that's what it should be to me as a lawyer, so that somebody looking at it can see exactly what it's intending to do. And um, there has been a tendency for political reasons, certainly at Westminster level, I, I should have, I'm not commenting about the Northern Ireland because I, I, I haven't followed your legislative processes closely enough to, to comment. Where I have worried over the years, my time in Parliament certainly, that we were enacting legislation which was, bluntly speaking, pretty vacuous. It, it enabled the government to get a headline saying that it was doing something, but actually when you looked at what it was doing, it didn't really amount to very much. And it wasn't often very clear what it was that it was doing. You know, classic example, setting targets. Targets on reducing emissions, for example. Well, some of those can be yeah. I used to say to colleagues, be careful what you're doing. Do you want a judge ultimately to decide this or do you not? And sometimes I was saying, oh, no, 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 this won't be the way we've drafted it. It won't never be interpreted. A judge can't, can't force this on us. They are declarations of intent. Well, I said, if it's a declaration of intent, it doesn't have to be made in the statute. You can make your declaration of intent standing up at the dispatch box in the House of Commons and telling the House of Commons you intend to do something. A law is a law. And laws have consequences, and you know, breaking them can lead to penalties. So you should be very careful about enacting law which doesn't mean what it says or isn't intended to do something. That's all. That's my, my only point on that. OK, thank you. All right, John. Dominic, thank you very much for, for joining us again this afternoon, and uh, your contribution has, has been helpful, as always. So appreciate that. Thank you. It's a great pleasure, and uh, thank you very much for asking me. Um, and uh, I shall look forward with interest to see what you, you come up with, and also with interest, particular interest in the next eight weeks to find out exactly what the charter rights <laughs> regime will be for Northern Ireland uh, on the 1st of January. And I'll be watching with bated breath. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Hi. Members, um, we can now go to uh, agenda item three. So. You should have all received table papers on Tuesday or yesterday um, with a, a letter from the Women's Policy Group. So you'll be aware that we had an online consultation for the online consultation last Thursday after the committee meeting and we got some feedback during that and some of the groups were concerned about the length of the consultation. So if you see, it, it starts at page 10 of the table pack, uh, the letter from the, the Women's Policy Group where they're asking for an extension to the consultation. So I don't know if members have views. I'm in town for us to send. Paula? Um, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I've, I've no issue with the extension at all. I think probably the, a lot of these groups may not have been aware that we've been doing so much work over the last few months anyway, so it's probably taken me a bit by surprise. But I suppose um, we've, we've had some terrific presentations over the last few months. It's been really, really excellent. And I'm just wondering at what stage do we then start moving into more substantive engagement with uh, sectoral groups like the women's sector? Will that be after the new year? Do we, you know, so obviously we'll take their, or their written evidence. What, at what stage do we then start bringing them in and start looking at? We don't have, do, do we have in the forward work uh, programme? Who have we got scheduled? Yeah. It seems more that not more of the same, but you know what I mean. It's just very similar. Mm. I'm talking about more 
where it's more the voluntary or charitable sector to come in? Because I think that would be an excellent one to... Yeah, we can we can put requests. I know that I've had I've had an email from I think the Children's Law Centre about um, presenting to us. So we, we could take that on board and, and reach mm -hmm. out to the groups and ask them that they would come in and provide written evidence. Yes, um, Chair, we're reviewing the board work programme. We've only got up to, to Christmas at this point, yes. um, and certainly we're be looking to engage more with. NGOs and, and lobby groups and so on in the new year. So, um, if members have particular groups or anything, please let us know and we'll build that into the forward work plan. Yeah, thank you. Through the Chair, do you, do you have, had, have you had a lot of requests to come and speak to us? Um, Chair, no, mostly the members have had a few letters and um, have agreed quality coalition was one example, um, but the call for evidence has just open so I would expect more to come from that as that sort of goes forward. This is going to have to be managed of course you know so we just almost by sector or something. Yeah. What you said there is probably key that this is highlighted it to them. Mm -hmm. This has been going on maybe in the background. But, yeah. Um, so yeah no I think we should as, as and when people uh, approach us we should definitely add them onto the, the programme we can do that. Yeah, and Chair, there's options to do a range of events. We can do, obviously, a lot of things have to be virtual and so on at the moment, um, where we can take a number of groups uh, together if there's mm -hmm. any from a particular sector. So lots of options. So we'll, I'll come up with some options for yeah. members shortly. I know that letter is co-signed. So is everyone then happy? Will we go with 12 weeks? Is everyone content mm -hmm. with that? Yeah. So I don't know if members over Starleaf have any views contrary to that. I'm guessing that they don't. So um, everyone then is, is content to extend the consultation period until the end of January 2021. So there's no downside from your point of view, Caroline? Um, yeah, I just, I suppose it pushes it a bit later, you know, we'll take a few weeks afterwards to fill out the report and so on, and it is useful to get the consultation responses um, to inform committees for work, but I think it is more important perhaps to give the stakeholders a time to, to come up with their responses and so on. We want to be mindful of our deadline, but I suppose it, it has to be a balance and we need to engage with as many as possible. So um, <coughs> that's the chair's business. <coughs> we don't have any. Then we have correspondence. <coughs> Are members content to note that? Yep. yep. Um, so our draft minutes then, if, if uh, members can agree the, the minutes. Yeah. Agreed. <coughs> Yeah. Yep. Okay, okay. So forward work programme, page twenty one of the pack. Everyone happy to note that? Yep. Okay, so um well we're still in live session. Sorry, I'm did you respond in the memo? Or if you covered it? Oh yeah, well, we just noted the correspondence there, but there's a, there's a note from Dermot Nes, but he wanted to correct something that he had given us in his oral briefing, so I'm sure enough. everyone's happy to note that. Okay. Um, while we're still in public session, our next meeting will be Thursday the 19th of November at 2pm. Sorry, I had something under any other business. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, uh, no, it was just really to get an update on the um, issue of our legal advisors or, or the... Expert panel. Expert panel, sorry. Yeah, we have a, a note there as well from the Executive Office. Um, we haven't we haven't received any update on when they'll actually come into place. We might want to write to the executive office on that. Members be happy for us to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're we're motoring on really. And yeah, I suppose a lot of it's they can watch watch back and read the documents and stuff. But it says just that engagement with the committee. Yeah, Please. no to to again mindful of our deadline but we we have that at, at item six but there's nothing substantial in it so sorry chair just would members wish to ask when the when we could expect uh, the panel to be appointed <coughs> an update on progress yeah okay yes, please. yeah I, I think we should point out that we are hearing from experts on a weekly basis mm -hmm. we're motoring on reaching the end of the year Okay, so, sorry, third time lucky, day time place the next meeting, Thursday the 19th November, 2pm, and we'll hear from Colin Canadian. So, close the meeting now, because we've got... <laughs>